Hello, everyone. Welcome to Copyright is a Balancing Act. I'm Rhonda Rosen, Head of Media and Access Services in the Hannon Library. I am joined today by Carla Kane, our Library Assistant in Charge of Reserve Services and Copyright. Carla, Carla also maintains the library's electronic reserve system known as EO. So, today we're going to talk about copyright, what it is, and how to use it. We will include guidelines that you are probably familiar with, like Fair Use and the TEACH Act. We will talk about resources that you might use in your teaching, some the library can offer you, some you can find on your own. What we won't tell you is what you can and cannot do with regard to copyright. We are not lawyers. We will be happy to tell you what the academic standards are, what best practices look like, what we can do for you, and what we can't. Copyright law is flexible and truly a balancing act, and you will need to make your own decisions based on what you hear today. So let's begin. Hi, this is Carla Kane. I'm the Reserves and Copyright Supervisor for the William H. Shannon Library, and we're going to start out with a basic definition of copyright. Copyright is a form of protection provided by the laws of the United States to the authors of original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other intellectual works. This protection is available to both published and unpublished works. So that's the statement from the Copyright Act of 1976. But let's take a look at what it actually means. Basically what it means is that if you're the creator of a specific type of work, you have the exclusive right to reproduce the work. So for example, something as simple as making copies of an article to prepare derivative works based upon the work. So for example, if someone wants to translate your novel into German, they have to get permission from you to do so. Um, distribute copies of the work, i.e. emailing copies of an article. Um, perform the work publicly. So for example, if you'd like to have a public film screening or stage a play. And also to display the work publicly, um, especially in the case of literary and dramatic work. Um, a good modern day example of that is posting photographs on the internet. So it should really be your photographs or photographs that you have permission to use. Violating these rights constitutes infringement and um, individuals can be sued for infringement as long as the copyright has been registered. So another question Rhonda and I get all the time is, well, how long does copyright last? Well, the short answer is it lasts a long time. Um, for an individual work, say, um, again, take the example of a novel, um, the life of the author plus 70 years is how long the copyright will last there. Um, if you have an anonymous work or a work with a pseudonym or a work for hire, say that a, uh, something that you wrote for the government while you were employed for the government, um, then it will last the life of the author plus 75 years. Um, or a, an, even an unpublished anonymous work or pseudonymous work will last the life of the author plus 120 years. Um, we also wanted to put in a little caveat there. Um, college instructors um, are, are not, has, have an exemption from this. If you write something as a college instructor, um, and then you're, it's not considered a work for hire. OK, so let's take a look at some things that are protected by copyright and some things that are not. So clearly, literary works, Digital content, even blogs, material on blogs, or original material and emails, musical works, dramatic works, um, images, sculptural works, architectural works, um, even computer software. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but computer software is licensed. It's not owned by you just because you bought it. You have essentially bought the license to use it. Um, items that are not protected by copyright. Well, you know that fascinating conversation you had with uh, Steven Spielberg the other night? Nope, that's just improvised speech. So sorry, but it's not copyright protected. Titles, um, short phrases, slogans, familiar symbols or designs, ideas, facts. Um, the, the, something that Rhonda and I always use as an example is like the periodic table. The periodic table cannot be copyrighted. It's not copyright protected. Works created by the government or anything to just fall into the public domain. So the public domain, that essentially means that um, the copyright has expired, or it never had a copyright. Sometimes items are even gifted to the public domain by the authors. So that means that anyone and everyone, they're perfectly free to use it. 
So let's take a look at some exemptions that educators would be especially interested in to copyright law. So um, there are certain exemptions to copyright law which say even though the creators of a work have the exclusive right to do the things which I discussed earlier, there are exceptions for things like teaching, which is most relevant to us here at Loyola Marymount. So Section 1101 um, is an exemption to copyright law which covers in-classroom teaching. So it says that um, these, you know, if you use material in this way, you're not infringing copy on copyright. Performance or display of work by instructors or pupils in the classroom in the course of face-to-face -face teaching activity when you're in a nonprofit educational institution, which is most colleges and universities. So in summary, what 1101 is saying is as long as you're using material that's directly related to the curriculum, as long as the performance or display occurs during the course of regular teaching activities, as long as you're using a lawfully obtained copy, you're not infringing. So, and again, this covers face-to-face -face teaching. So, several years later, in 2002, as um, online education started becoming more and more of an issue, the, t the performance and display provision of the copyright law was amended to include something called the TEACH Act. So, the TEACH Act was added in order to help make very clear that um, teaching online is also every bit as important and credible as teaching in class. So not only could you, is it okay to, to do the first four things when you're teaching, but online, um, in addition to that, as long as you are following these certain guidelines, you won't be infringing when you use material in, to teach within your online classes. So again, if you want to be at a nonprofit institution, part of regular teaching activities, um, your class is limited to a, the, the students enrolled in the class. Um, in particular, Ron and I wanted to point out you, the use of the material must be either for live or asynchronous class sessions. Asynchronous just means it's okay to store the material um, on a server to be used for teaching. Um, only reasonable and limited portions. Of, of materials, say a film, such as might be performed or displayed during a typical live classroom session may be used. This is a slight difference from Section 1101, because in Section 1101, it's perfectly fine to show a whole film in class. Here in Section 1102, they're saying, you really shouldn't show the whole film um, online, you should just show clips. However, if you need to show the whole film, fair use covers that, and we're going to talk about that later. And because we're at such an, an institution with excellent infrastructure, we have lots of things in place to protect um, the copyright policies, for example, technological measures to ensure compliance with the policies beyond merely assigning a password, um, user location and authentication, IP checking, etc. We have all that already built in here at Loyola, so we know we're complying with the law. Some things that the TEACH Act specifically does not cover concerns act, um, ac academic activities that would happen outside of the classroom. So like electronic reserves, interlibrary loan, online textbooks that are designed to be used online, um, con converting materials from digital to analog, um, except when the converted material is used solely for authorized transmissions and when a digital version is unavailable. But it's also important to note that fair use covers material which the TEACH Act does not mention. So let's talk about fair use. Um, Ron and I spent a lot of time um, discussing fair use and explaining it to others and making sure we're using it properly. But the nice thing about fair use is that it's nice and flexible and broad when it comes to things like edu education. So Section 107 of the Copyright Law says that fair use can be invoked in order to avoid infringement um, for the use of copyright protected material for culturally beneficial purposes such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, satire, parody, and teaching. And what Section 107 says is that when you're thinking about how much material it's okay to use without permission, because that was, so we're talking about using copyright protected material without permission, um, Section 107 provides four factors to address this. So what they're saying is think about how you're using this material. The purpose and character of the use. It's nonprofit educational use versus commercial use. 
the nature of the item being used, nonfiction work versus fiction or highly creative work, the amount to be used, small amounts versus the entire work, the market effect on the item, one-time use versus repeated or long-term use. So in general, um, using small amounts of nonfictional material in a nonprofit institution such as LMU, that tends to favor fair use. Using large amounts of fictional material tends not to favor fair use. However, it doesn't mean that you can't use it or that somehow you're going to be sued if you use it or something terrible is going to happen. It doesn't mean that at all. It really just means Think about how you're using the material. Um, think very carefully about whether or not you can justify the use of material in your class. And if, if in fact, you can, then go ahead. Go ahead and use it. As long as you can provide an argument for fair use, um, you'll be fine. The idea really isn't to restrict people from using material. The idea is to just have people think carefully about how they're using it and that they're using the amount of material they need. Carla, I have a quick question. Okay, we'll stop there for a quick question. Um, this is Trey. Hi, Trey. So, hey, so <laughs> the the copyright, um, the, the four prong test you just talked about, yes, and the fair use is is really concerning whether or not you need to go get permission or not. Yes, it's and not, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, that the the four factor test is asking is saying, um, okay, you want to use this permission, this material for your class. You don't have to, to ask permission from the copyright holder. Um, it's an exemption to the exclusive right of the, of the copyright holder. But just take into consideration these four factors. How much of it are you going to use? Are you going to use um, you know, uh, the, the entire book? Are you going to use the heart of the work? Are you going to use small amounts so that your students can simply see the writing style of the writer? It's just sort of asking you to think about how you're using it so that you're not using so much of the material that it could potentially damage the market um, effect of it for, for the author or for the person who originally created it. But it's not saying you can't use it at all. So and, for, Go ahead. Go ahead and finish. I was just going to say, um, and so in some cases you may end up using more material, but if, if it falls under fair use, you're using it in a restricted setting with only your students and only your students can have access to the material and you're not trying to sell it on the street or sell anything, um, you know, in any way make a profit off of the other author at that author's expense, you'll be fine. And that covers nine out of nine and a half educational uses. So most instructors are, you know, are going to be fine with fair use. Is there like a best practice using that four-pronged test? Like if it's two out of four, go ahead and just go get it, get permission from the the copyright holder, or if it's three out of four, you're you're probably in good shape. Is there any best practice on that one? Yeah, we have it. We have that um, a list of resources at the end, and one thing is a um, a list of best practices for educators, document filmmakers, etc. There's lot, there's sort of um, different disciplines have started to create their own best practices um, policies, and so we have a link to that at the end of the presentation. Okay. Yeah. But it's always a gray area. Um, okay, so so we'll, so going on, um, just a couple of things that are not covered under fair use. Basically, these things always have to be purchased. Um, for software, you don't own software. You've only purchased a license. You may make one copy of it for archival purposes. Consumables like student workbooks and manuals, those are meant to be purchased by each student for individual use. Very often, the students have to write in the manual. So the market value is lowered when only one copy is bought and photocopied by the entire class. So these things do not fall under fair use. OK, so this is Rhonda. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the resources that are out there available, either on the web or in the library. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is video. Um, at, at this time, LMU does not have an option for streaming videos. However, the Hannon Library does subscribe to a number of different streaming video collections, which allow you to add high quality media content to your course instruction, whether in class or online. And with these databases, there is no need to check out a DVD or a VHS tape. So you and your students are able to log in to the databases with your My, My LMU ID for immediate access to the film content over the internet. 
Um, the, what I have on the screen are some products from Alexander Street Press. And they have video databases which provide video content across a variety, wide variety of topics. You can see they have American history, classical music and video, opera and video, dance and video, counseling and therapy, uh, education and theater in video are all the different products that they have. Um, also included under this banner are films from the Filmmakers Library Online, which is a collection of award-winning documentaries with relevance across the curriculum. These films generally uh, are about race and gender studies, human rights, globalization and global studies, multiculturalism, international relations, criminal justice, environment, bioethics. It's a, it's a really large, large, uh, broad grouping of videos, of documentaries. So um, one thing about video streaming, though, don't forget that streaming video requires a robust, high-speed internet connection, which we have, luckily. Also, playback of stream video requires that your student's computer has the appropriate player software installed. Uh, the most commonly used streaming frameworks include Windows Media, Real Player, QuickTime, and Flash. And before we go on, I just want to say what we've transitioned to are items that you can use without concern for copyright, fair use, et cetera. These are things that are licensed that you can use because the library has provided them for you. So if you were to go into um, America history uh, in video, this would be a screenshot. This happens to be a screenshot from Ken Burns' Civil War, which is in that database. Um, this is what you would begin to see. Uh, all of these collections can be searched by the director, the producer, the title, the series, or the subject area. All of these databases allow you to make your own film clips and create playlists for your students, which can be embedded in your Blackboard or eRes course page or shared. Um, as you can note, the arrow points to, out to where you can begin to make clips. And at the top of the page is the embed code and persistent link. Each video in the Alexander Street products have a persistent link and an embed code. All videos will be open. Um, will open to full screen projection. So if you're in your classroom, you can uh, fully project them onto your screen. Um, and in many cases, the complete video transcript is included. So there um, are a vast number of free, openly accessible internet sites which provide access to streaming videos. These sites may host their own content, or they merely point to content hosted elsewhere. Sometimes advertising supports some of these sites. Others, like PBS Video, are the official site for a producer, distributor, a series, or even a, um, media that matters film festivals, one that does film a festival. Um, the searching functions on these sites can vary widely. And beware, content can change and be possibly removed without notice. So if you bookmark a video clip on YouTube, for example, don't be surprised if it isn't there when you need it. Um, there's also pay-per-view. Uh, pay-per-view is paying for your own use. Uh, if you don't want what the library is offering you at free of charge, feel free to pay for it yourself. Um, I'm sure most of you who have gone on Amazon to purchase things has noted that there is a video on demand. Um, it's a service which provides access to more than 45,000 titles on a pay-per-view basis. Um, most of these titles are offered are feature films, TV shows, uh, there are documentaries and other forms also available. The rental prices differ per title, but generally they fall around the three to four dollar range. Um, once you pay, the streaming can begin immediately, or you can delay it for later viewing. Um, licensing terms for each video specify the time frame for viewing, so it might give you a 30-day uh, overall span of when you can use it, and it may give you a, tell you that the viewing window is actually 48 hours. Um, you can also, when you do do that, it will ask you to set up a user account, and it will ask you for your credit card information. Um, Netflix works in the same way, um, and both Amazon and Netflix um, do are licensed, and you are actually, as with other computer software, you are purchasing the license to use it. So. Um, in Title 17, Chapter 1, 110, 1, that Carla talked to you about, where it says you may show all or part of a movie in a face-to-face -face classroom, um, Netflix and Amazon do put in their license agreement 
that it should be um, personal or non-commercial use. So even though the subscription doesn't actually say don't use it in a classroom, and they probably won't, um, technically speaking, it isn't um, considered personal use when you're using it in the classroom. But I haven't yet to see Netflix or Amazon go after anybody for using uh, streaming in the classroom. So um, there's another uh, new thing that I don't know a lot about, but it's called Can I Stream It? And I've noticed that it's a free service. And uh, the site does cover, basically it shows when you type in a search where this title can be found, whether it be instant viewing, uh, rental, purchase, and it some, will also tell you if it's available on DVD. Um, so what about VHS tapes? Um, okay, so this is something that we get asked about all the time. So as many of you are probably aware, the university has been renovating classrooms and taking out the video cassette playback equipment. So what do you do with your VHS tape? Well, if they are your own legally purchased or personal tape, Go ahead, make a copy in the Faculty Innovation Center. The staff will be happy to show you how to do it. However, if the VHS tape is library owned, please contact me. I will get permission to transfer the tape from the copyright holder, or I will evaluate whether we can legally make a DVD copy for the library's collection. So to summarize our video use, um, there is a difference between using video for traditional face-to-face -face teaching in the classroom and on, on, online teaching. Whereas you can play a full movie in your classroom, when it comes to online courses, full video streaming requires a license or permission. And as we've said, the library does own licensed products, uh, and, we, and if we don't, and it's something that you need to find permission to use, then we will help you find that person. So um, also about clips, uh, remember if you use film clips in your class, there are a number of ways to do it. First of all, you can certainly buy the film and then use the clip from that DVD in your class. Better yet, you can borrow the film from the library and you can create your own short clips in the Faculty Innovation Center and use them in your course. You can use films found in the library streaming video collections as we pointed out and in that um, in those Alexander Street Press video collections, you can create lists, playlists for your students, you can uh, have clips, you can embed them in your course pages. Um, and these are all protected under fair use. Um, and the final thing is that you can go on these open URL sites and get a clip that way. So uh, now we want to go move to visual resources. Um, as you can see from this, there are. This is just a very, very tiny bit of what's out there on the internet. Um, the first one, Art Store, is something that we own, and I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then the other ones, Library of Congress, offers an amazing um, collection of images. Smithsonian Galaxy of Images and New York Public Library. These are all really, really large and um, usable image collections. Um, as with um, videos, um, the Hannon Library does subscribe to Art Store, which is an amazing digital library of more than one million images in the arts, architecture, humanities, and social sciences for you to use. The images are gathered for most of the greatest museums, libraries, and private collections. Um, again, if you do find something on the web and you want to use it in your online teaching, it can, can be considered fair use. However, if you are publishing a book and you want to include photos, I would look for permission. So uh, Art Store, which the library licenses, we have a subscription to, comes, it comes with a suite of software tools to view and present and manage your images for your research and instructional purposes. Art Store's images are available in medium resolution format for export and used in PowerPoint or other presentation programs. It's also got high resolution format for online presentations or to download into their own offline image viewer. You can search their database and create a folder of saved images to be dropped into your PowerPoint presentations with ease. One small caveat about using ArtStore, be aware of where you are using these images. If you're putting them into your course materials, which are accessed through our password protected systems such as MyLMU, all is well. But if you're using them on a website that is accessible to the public, you may get a call asking you to take it down like one of our librarians received recently. 
Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to music. Uh, as with many of the Alexander Street Press video collections, they also have audio streaming collections that we license. So you can access the various collections through our library catalog by their name, or you can use the music online platform, which will allow you to cross-search many of their music databases. And they are listed below. The classical music library, opera and video, classical musical and video, jazz, contemporary music, et cetera. They all can be searched by one platform. Um, so the classical music, music library uh, has more than 150,000 tracks. It includes recordings from many of the greatest classical labels. Coverage includes music written from the earliest times, like Gregorian chant, to the present. And the repertoire ranges from vocal and choral music to chamber, orchestral, orchestral solo, instrumental, and opera. Um, another resource that we have is the Contemporary World Music Database, and that is the sounds from many regions from every continent, so including reggae, world beat, uh, world fusion, African film, Bollywood, uh, Indian classical, et cetera, flamenco, klezmer, everything. And then finally, we also include in here the Jazz Library, which has the world's most renowned jazz artists, performances, and labels, including Verve, Impulse, et cetera. Um, one last one is the Naxos Music Library. And Naxos is the world's largest collection of online music library from the catalog of Naxos, which is the leading classical music label. And although it is best known for its classical recordings, it has an amazing uh, database of jazz and national anthems included in it. It in includes streaming access to more than 46,000 CDs with more than 600,000 tracks. Um, the repertoire can be searched, again, um, in all different ways. And um, there are also includes text resources, including overviews of music history, program notes for recordings, and complete libretti of operas within that database. OK, so now we're going to move from the visual and more creative to the less creative. But these are journal articles from our library-owned databases, or library-subscribed databases. The library subscribes to over 200 different research databases covering all areas of the curriculum. Over 75% of these databases offer you the ability to export the content into your course content. So if you're using one of our journal article databases, you should keep in mind that it is better to link to the article rather than copying it. And when uh, you do that, notice, always look for the permanent link. And I've circled that on there on the top of the screen and the right of the screen. And here it's called, in this database, it happens to be called a permalink. Sometimes it's called a durable link or a stable URL or something like that. You sh it should be noticeable to you. Um, the other thing we wanted to mention, and what's becoming more pre prevalent everywhere, including our library, are ebooks. Um, this is a library record that can be found in our catalog for an ebook title. The title of the book is The Copyright Thing Doesn't Work Here. Um, when you come upon this type of ebook record, the way to access it is on the left hand arrow, you see the word, it says this title is available electronically via eBrary. eBrary is the collection that that comes from, and you would just click on there. Um, also notice the middle of the page and the arrow following it says instructors may link to this from Blackboard. So that's just telling you that it is permitted to link and use this. Um, when you do link to it, uh, just be forewarned that you are linking to the front page of the book. Not, you aren't able to um, link into a certain chapter or page. So you would have to refer your students to the front and then they would have to look at the table of contents and find that page within it. And now I'm going to turn it back to Carla. Hi, so we're wrapping things up now. But we just wanted to leave you with a few um, quick reminders. In general, when you're using material online, um, you want to avoid certain things and try to make sure to incorporate certain things. So for example, instead of downloading or emailing journal articles like the ones Rhonda just showed us, go ahead and just copy and paste that link to the article. And you can put that in your, in your Blackboard page, for example. Instead of recording a TV program to show in class, purchase a copy, or better yet, come and see if the library has it. Thanks to Rhonda, she's our media guru. We have an excellent collection. Instead of embedding an entire YouTube video into your, your course, go ahead and use the share link and just use the link. 
for, for MP3 and, and podcast. Link to the web page that it's on. Try to avoid downloading the entire, again, just like with YouTube, downloading the entire MP3 or podcast onto your page. Um, go ahead and just point to it with the link. And be sure to warn your students not to download um, the recording and you know email or distribute it to others. In general, just remember when you're dealing with these kinds of media online, do not copy or distribute. Remember, that's the exclusive right of the copyright holder. Always find a way to point to, link to, et cetera. That's the safest way to share things. Uh, finally, Rhonda just showed you lots and lots of great library resources that you can use without worrying about um, copyright or licensing because the library is taking care of that for you. A final thing we wanted to just point your attention to is Creative Commons. Creative Commons um, is sort of a, a group of people who've come together to create kind of a, a copy left or an artificial public domain where they're deliberately putting work into a kind of uh, public domain, which they have named Creative Commons, to say, hey, this work is work that people can use. We're giving people everyone permission to use it um, with certain very minimal restrictions. And you can see here they have a whole they have a whole series of levels of permission that they're giving to people who want to use their material. So for example, at the first level we have attribution and we have two thumbs up. Can I use it commercially? Yes. Can someone create new versions of it? Sure. Drop down a couple of levels under no derivatives. Can I use it commercially? Yes. Can someone create new versions of it? No. So you can see they provided all different levels of permission, but basically what they're trying to do is create a way for um, everyone to have access to the material they create. And Creative Commons isn't just um, images or pictures. There's also science articles. There's all kinds of things in Creative Commons. So we encourage you to use it, um, check it out, and just be sure to pay attention to the level of licensing that the creator has given it. Lastly, um, <laughs> we use this. Uh, we like this image, Ron and I, because um, it's really true. In many cases concerning copyright, you really can't ask and you have received permission. If you find yourself in a position where um, you're not sure about something, um, what, what its status is, can I use it, can I, can I use fair use, or maybe I need to use more of it than might fall under fair use, I'm not sure, just go ahead and ask. Um, I do this all the time in my position as copyright supervisor. Frequently, I'll just dash off an email to whether it's an organization or a person, another instructor, a blogger, say, hey, um, this instructor wants to use this article for their class. Here's the class. Here's what's going to do with it. It's just for a semester. Is it OK? They'll send me back an email that's sure, that's, that's fine. Go ahead. And what I do is I keep all of that correspondence on file. And then I just go ahead and use the material. Um, you'll find that many times people just are just glad that you asked and they're happy to let you use their material. Um, and even if you, you write to them and you don't get a response back, go ahead and keep your letter on file as it, to, to demonstrate that you did make a good faith effort to contact the copyright holder, if necessary. And here is the resource list that I talked about earlier. Um, there's, we have right here at LMU, we've got a great lib guide on copyright. And we also want to call your attention to the visual research guide. Um, but there's the University of Texas at Austin has a great little thing called the Copyright Crash Course. The um, Association of Research Libraries has a nice chart, Know Your Copyrights. These are places where you can go and just quickly look things up to determine, oh, am I falling into fair use or not? Yeah, I think I am. Oh, maybe not. The one that we especially wanted to point out was Center for Social Media Fair Use Codes and Best Practices. Um, Trey, this is what I was referring to earlier. If you check that out, there are several disciplines listed where instructors have come together to create codes and best practices for their discipline. And so drawing on that, you can determine whether or not something that you want to use falls into fair use. Even if your discipline isn't covered, you can, you can see the way that the, the process happens for deciding fair use. And lastly, um, Science Commons, that's the, the science sort of area of Creative Commons. And Recommended Reading, a fabulous book, Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back in Copyright. That was created by um, a group of academics and lawyers who were concerned that um, fair use laws weren't being used broadly enough um, and that structures, instructors weren't aware of their rights concerning copyright. So um, they wrote this book. It, it was just published in 2011. Ron and I went to a conference um, and heard them speak. And it's really an excellent resource we have here in the library, so I recommend it. So now we're going to go ahead and open it up for your questions. and. Um, 
I think Trey has been <clears throat> keeping track of our chat list for questions. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we don't have any questions coming in yet, but if you guys have any questions, put them into the chat box. Um, or if you would like to speak, let me know that in the chat box too so I can un unmute you. Okay. Um, but I did have some couple of, a couple of questions myself. Great. Okay. Um, the first one was um, if, if you do get permission from the copyright holder mm -hmm. um, to use their material one semester, do you have to, re to, do you have to get permission again the following semester? Or how does that work generally? Um, yes. I would say yes. Um, part of when I write letters out to copyright holders, I always put a, a note at the bottom. You know, part of my letter says, "If we need the material again, we will um, write to you again and seek permission." So yes, I do it each semester per item. Okay. So now, in the, a, go ahead. Go ahead and finish. Oh, I was just going to say, and sometimes, um, you know. If, um, they'll, in the first letter they send you, they'll say, yes, go ahead, um, use it for as, much, as long as you need to, and then you wouldn't, you know, obviously you wouldn't have to continue to write to them, but I always make it very specific um, that if it's not clear, I'll, I'll ask them again oh, next semester. And also, I want to remind, me to remind you that under fair use, the first use of anything is always free. You don't have to get permission, et cetera. It's just when you want to use it for a second and third and fourth and fifth, et cetera, semesters. Um, if you're going to use it continually, then you need to get permission. Okay, well that's great because that was my second question. Okay, <laughs> uh, but Faye, Faye has a question. What if the textbook is out of print and the faculty member is the only one with a copy? How do we handle that? Okay, now if you're if you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, I'd say you know bring the book, come bring the book, bring the book to the library and put it on our reserve shelf. Um, if you're faced with a situation where you have an entire textbook that's out of print, um, and is it that you want to use the whole textbook or just portions of the textbook? What if we wanted to copy a chapter out of the book, a chapter or two? Okay, that's fine. And then you could you could bring that over here to the library and put it on the our electronic reserve. You could do that. You could also do that. The one to two chapters, that's certainly a reasonable limited portion. You could you could scan and put that um, on your web page. But also keep in mind that just because something is out of print doesn't mean that you can't find the publisher. Um, it may not really be out of print, or you may be able to contact the publisher directly to get permission to use something that's out of print. OK, and I have my other question was related to your Creative Commons slide. Mm -hmm. Um, is LMU doing anything in regards to like open educational resources or developing a repository of of open uh, educational material or content? Well, I mean, when when the library licenses and and subscribes to all these databases, in a sense, those are open for your use. Um, but in terms of a repository, there is an LMU repository that the library works on where faculty can put um, their articles, their resumes, whatever they want to be put on there. Um, and I can send you a link to that page if you want to see that. Um, there is also a couple of online journals that have gone up there that are published by uh, LMU or hosted by LMU on there too. So, um, but in terms of a Creative Commons, not really, no. Okay. I'm going to unmute everybody and, and just open it up. Do, does anyone else have any questions for Rhonda or, or Carla? When our questions, this is Faye speaking, when our questions come up about copyright, who is the best resource, the, the name of the person that would be the best resource for us to talk to? Hi, you can speak to both myself and to Rhonda. So mine, I'm Carla Kane. My email is ccain at lmu.edu. Um, if you can't reach me or you just want to speak to someone else, you can talk to Rhonda. Our, R-O-S-E-N at lmu.edu. And we would also say be sure to check out the library's LibGuide. It may answer your questions before you um, even reach for the phone. You might not even need to talk to anyone after you read through our LibGuide. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
one one more question uh, for for students. Um, do they get any information from the library about copyright um, issues in their academic coursework? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, other than what the faculty, in, you know, talk to them about plagiarism and you know, uh, on, and may put on their syllabus and the the conduct code that the LMU conduct code. I'm not really sure. Um, the library does do a lot of bibliographic instruction to our students, um, but they probably do more about finding resources and how to use them than it is about really copyright. However, the film school does have, I know that they have addressed copyright in terms of their film students and, and um, getting licensing for things that they do in making films. But really, to be honest, we pretty much, uh, any, any of the copyright stuff that we've done has really gone mostly to faculty. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, as Carla pointed out, we do have a libguide on copyright that anybody is out there on the web, so anybody technically could see it. Mm -hmm. And I also have a, a video on copyright that's also on that same libguide page. Very small PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Elaine had a question. Is yeah. there um, some mathematical number or function to determine what's reasonable and uh, the portion control was limited and was reasonable? Um, well, the answer is yes and no. Um, <laughs> Copyright is a balancing act. <laughs> um, if, 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 you, <laughs> if you check out um, uh, some of the uh, web, uh, websites I put on the resource list, for example, the um, University of Texas Austin has sort of the official guidelines that um, the first group of people who came together to try to do the initial uh, best practices list, um, it'll say things like, oh, you can use 10% of a poem, or you can use 250 words of an essay, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's sort of very limited. But those are really just guidelines. Um, so there's no specific mathematical equation outside of the, you know, the four factors to determine reasonable and limited portions. And um, for the it's copyright reason, it's deliberately flexible um, and, vague. And, and vague, and some would say vague, <laughs> because um, they want, you know, they want to give people um, room to use things and, and flexibility, and they're not trying to box you in. So essentially, it comes down to can you justify it for the purposes that you want to use it for? And um, um, so that's why it sort of deliberately left it very open. You can check out those, those guidelines if you want. Like I said, it's on our resource list just to give you an idea. Um, and, um, and yeah. And then we have our own guidelines. Right. Especially for like things that you put on reserve. So, right. like we say, we will generally 10% or one, maybe two chapters of, of a book, book. Right. whichever, you know. Um, in terms of film clips, we try to ascribe to the guidelines that most places are using, where it's like two, three, four minutes of a film. Um, you know, it really is your own good judgment. Mm -hmm. And, the, right, the library has to be, we choose to be very conservative because we're a large institution and people sort of like to sue institutions. <laughs> so we deliberately err on the side of caution. But in general, when it comes to you and your classroom teaching, there is a lot of flexibility. As long as you are using a, um, a method of determining that's based on, for example, the best practices for educators in your department or based on clearly what you need for your course. As long as you can justify it and make it clear that you're not using it and in a commercial exploitative way and then you should be fine. But yeah, it's so the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I don't think we have any other questions coming in. Okay. So thank you ladies. Thank Good you. Information. Okay.